Today's episode is sponsored by Uni, the portable pizza oven that allows you to make amazing pizza at home. To make today's pies, I'll be using the Uni Coda 16, a propane-fueled pizza oven that can reach temperatures up to 932 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the same as a traditional pizza oven, giving you amazing flash-fired pizza like you'd find from your favorite pizza place. Head to the link in the video description to find out how to get yours, but for now, let's get down to basics. Before we get into the endless ways in which you can manipulate flour, water, salt, and yeast into pizza dough, let's talk a little pizza dough theory. First up, hydration. Different styles of pizza dough require different hydrations. Most pizza doughs have a hydration between 60 and 70 percent. That is to say, the amount of water in the dough is 60 to 70 percent of the weight of the flour. The higher the hydration, the softer and more open crumb the final product will have. But the more difficult to handle the dough will be, so higher hydration doughs are generally better for pan pizzas in Sicilian style. Next up, the all-important act of gluten formation. All pizza requires gluten development, some more than others. Once all of your ingredients are combined, there are a few different ways that you can develop gluten, the most well-known and widely dreaded of which is kneading by hand. Kneading can be a sticky, frustrating, and exhausting process for newcomers to the kitchen, so if you're not confident in your forearm strength and if you're not worried about what your downstairs neighbors are going to think, you might want to try the slap and fold technique, that is, slapping the dough down, doing your best to eliminate elongate it on the downstroke, folding it over on itself, turning it 90 degrees, and repeating. This works especially well with higher hydration doughs that are difficult to manage. Depending on the rapidity and strength of your slaps, this could take anywhere from 6 to 15 minutes, and you'll know that it's done when the dough becomes soft and supple and manageable and passes what's called the window pane test, which is the baker's standby practice of stretching a little piece of dough as thin as you can possibly manage, and if it becomes translucent without tearing, it has sufficient gluten development. A significantly more expensive but exponentially easier method is to use a stand mixer, which is pretty much as simple as adding your ingredients, affixing a dough hook, and letting it knead on medium speed for five to seven minutes. A slightly fussier but much faster method involves a food processor, whose violent blade whipping action can sufficiently develop gluten in a dough in as little as 90 seconds. Another easy method that requires no special equipment is what I'm going to call the fold it over on itself every five minutes or so method. This method starts by roughly combining our ingredients until no dry spots remain, covering and letting rest for five minutes, and then from the side, lifting the dough up onto itself, rotating 90 degrees, and repeating for four total folds, recovering with plastic wrap and letting rest for another five minutes, and then repeating the process over the course of 20 minutes for a grand total of four times, after which you'll find that your lumpy beginnings have effortlessly transformed into a soft, springy, well-developed dough. And then perhaps the laziest but most time-consuming method is the no-need method, that is combining all your ingredients until no dry spots remain covering and letting ferment at room temperature for 18 hours, after which you'll be delighted to find that your lumpy, craggly mass has developed into some oven-ready chewing gum. And so there you have it, a two and a half minute crash course on dough theory. Now let's put our theory to practice and make some pizza. We're starting with what is arguably the archetypal pizza of the pizza world, the Neapolitan style. This style of pizza calls for a chewy, toothsome crust, so we're using bread flour, 850 grams of the stuff, along with 12 grams of instant yeast that we're gonna tiny whisk together to make sure that it's evenly dispersed before adding our wet stuff. Neapolitan pizza typically has a hydration of about 65%, so that's about 550 grams of water, which we're gonna mix together until just combined before adding the salt. 17 grams worth of kosher salt, which we're adding at this stage to help protect the yeast, the delicate and necessary microorganisms that salt loves to bully. Once we get everybody combined, it's time to knead using your method of choice. I think that since this is Neapolitan pizza, I should probably knead by hand so as to not piss off the Italians, even though it's my third batch of pizza so far today and I'm getting a little tired. Just remember not to get too discouraged if your dough is really sticky, because as you work it, you're going to find it come together and become more cohesive and bouncy and springy and soft and awesome. And that first first hand-earned window pane test is going to feel all the more deserved and cathartic. And it's going to feel especially good if Sola L. Whaley drops by to steal your stand mixer and tells you you did a good job. It looks fantastic. Really, really bounce. Look at that. Wow. Pops right back. Kneaded with pain. Kneaded with, with, with rage. Yeah. Persistence. Rage. Anger. 
Well, that's about all the validation I could ask for this year. Anyway, now that our dough is kneaded and our gluten is developed, it's time to head into an oiled bowl. Where we're going to cover it and let it rest at room temperature for two hours during what's called a primary bulk fermentation. But if you want truly amazing Neapolitan pizza, you gotta do what's called a cold ferment in the fridge, which is basically just fridging it for three to five days. During this time, not only is the flavor going to deeply develop, but the gluten strands are going to lengthen, giving you that amazing chewy texture that you really want in Neapolitan pizza. Whether you cold fermented for days or just bulk fermented for a couple hours, it's time to divide and shape the dough. I'm dividing into six equal pieces by weight to ensure accuracy, and then I'm shaping into balls by rolling the dough between my hands and pinching the edges down underneath the dough itself to pull the top taut. At this stage, we want our dough balls as perfectly round and taut as possible, before either placing them on a lightly floured rim baking sheet or in a proofing container like this one. Cover and proof for one hour if you made your dough the same day, or one and a half to two hours if the dough is refrigerator cold. You want the dough to spread out and become a little poofy, but not quite double in size. Then at long last, it's time for things to start taking shape. First, we're flouring both our work surface and the dough itself before beginning to pat it out as wide as we can with our fingers, leaving a very small rim around the outside that will eventually become our crust. Then it's time to begin gently, slowly stretching our dough by passing it knuckle over knuckle until it gets just about as thin as you can get it, in this case about 12 inches wide. Then we're performing our final shaping and eventual topping on a generously floured pizza peel. And then for the simplest, most beautiful form of Neapolitan pizza, pizza margarita, we need only two things, roughly pureed whole San Marzano tomatoes with a generous pinch of kosher salt and shredded or torn pieces of fresh mozzarella, the shredding of which is made much easier by freezing beforehand for about 15 minutes. Both of these toppings are pretty high moisture, so you want to apply them very sparingly. There's no such thing as a Neapolitan pizza with extra toppings unless you want a pizza pool on your hands. Once it's topped up, it's time to head out to the oven, and this is one of those instances where you can really only make this in an oven like the uni. Because it's such a lean dough with a relatively high moisture content, this pizza would turn into a cracker if you tried to bake it in a home oven even at its highest setting. So this is the one style of pizza that truly needs the 932 degree Fahrenheit kiss of the uni. Once it emerges from the oven, oven is simply topped with torn basil, not before, but after it comes out of the oven, as has been vehemently pointed out to me by many commenters, before being sliced and served as desired. And guys, I gotta tell you, this is truly remarkable pizza. I still can't believe that I was able to make something like this in my house, with my hands, and my more often than not limited brain. But here it sits in all of its Neapolitan beauty. But what do you say we try on the exact opposite of Neapolitan pizza? Deep dish pan pizza. A pizza whose thickness and longer lower temperature cook time call for a higher hydration enriched dough. So into a bowl, we are combining about 240 grams of bread flour and about a half teaspoon or one and a half grams of instant yeast tiny whisk to disperse, and then we're adding 170 grams of water for a dough with a hydration of 70%. We're also adding 15 milliliters of olive oil, which is both going to add flavor, as well as shorten our gluten strands so we don't end up with pizza taffy. Mix just to combine before adding four grams or about three quarters of a teaspoon of kosher salt. Continue mixing until no dry spots remain, and then we're gonna do our lift and fold on itself technique. What did I call it last time? You know, the one where we give it four folds every 20 minutes and that develops our gluten for us without sapping us of our much needed strength. Once complete, it's best to let this guy rest in an oiled container overnight in the fridge. This is going to help develop its flavor. Then come pizza day, we're going to generously lubricate a 10-inch cast iron skillet with two to three tablespoons of olive oil, and then we're going to carefully dump our dough ball inside, flipping once to coat with oil and then gently pressing out to fill the bottom of the pan. Depending on how cold your dough is, you may experience some resistance, so don't be afraid to cover it with plastic wrap and let it rest for 15 minutes before trying again. Once shaped, we ultimately want it to be out of the fridge for about an hour and a half before topping and baking. To bake, we want to preheat a pizza stone in the oven at 550 degrees Fahrenheit for at least an hour, ensuring that the bottom of the pizza gets blasted with enough heat to make it crisp. You could also bake this in your uni by cranking down the flame so it gets to be around 550 degrees Fahrenheit. You can top it up however you like. I'm going with a more generous spread of our San Marzano tomatoes, a thick layer of low moisture mozzarella, making sure to spread it all the way out to the edges so you get that cheesy crunch on the outside, and some thick sliced pepperoni that's going to curl into little adorable pepperoni 
cups. That's getting topped up with some optional freshly grated Parmesan, and then it's ready for the oven, where it's gonna bake anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, being rotated once halfway through, until it comes out looking like this. Melty and bubbly and brown and literally deep frying before your very eyes. Now you gotta let this thing rest for at least 10 minutes, both to reabsorb the oil and if you at all value your delicate skin and mouth. Also to make sure that the bottom crunches up. If it's not crunchy enough for you, you can throw the whole thing on the stovetop over medium heat for two to three minutes until the bottom is crisp. Then all you gotta do is slice and serve. And prepare for this perfect example of everything you loved about pizza when you were a kid. Gooey cheese, saucy sauce, and most importantly, a soft and chewy yet oily and crunchy crust surrounded by a crown of crunchy deep fried cheese. So we've explored the very Italian and the very American pizza doughs. What about the Italian American pizza dough? The New York style. This very much straddles the line between the two and it is reflected in the dough as it is enriched with sugar and oil but has has a much lower hydration. So we're gonna try the food processor kneading method this time, combining 470 grams of bread flour, 25 grams of sugar, and about a half teaspoon or one and a half grams of yeast in the bowl of a food processor, which we're gonna process together a couple times, just to combine everybody, before streaming about 285 grams of ice water through the feed tube as the machine runs until a ball of dough forms, giving us a dough with a hydration of about 60%. Once it comes together, we're gonna switch it off and let it rest for 15 minutes before returning with nine grams of kosher salt and 15 milliliters of olive oil. Pop the lid back on and process for anywhere from 60 to 90 seconds until a dough forms that embodies the three S's, smooth, supple, and silky. Then using a lightly oiled countertop and your lightly oiled hands, we're gonna knead the dough until it sort of cohesively comes together into a very soft, smooth mass, which we're gonna form into a taut ball and place into an oiled container, which we're gonna proof in the fridge overnight. Once again, this isn't 100% necessary, but it's gonna greatly improve your dough's texture and flavor. After after its overnight stint in the fridge, it's time to divide, shape, and proof. This recipe from America's Test Kitchen is enough to make two 14-inch pizzas. So we're dividing our dough precisely in half, stretching into taut balls, and allowing to prove on a lightly floured rim baking sheet or a proofing box, and allowing to prove for two hours at room temperature or until light and poofy and very easy to work with. Then it's a similar situation to the Neapolitan pizzas, but on a larger, thicker scale. We do want to aim for 14 to 16 inches, and the dough is going to be slightly thicker than the Neapolitan. Neapolitan, but just barely. I'm talking about like three millimeters versus five millimeters. We still want it super thin, but thick enough to stand up to the incoming toppings, which we're going to apply as before on a lightly floured peel, this time opting for a cooked tomato sauce with garlic and basil, and lots and lots of shredded low moisture mozzarella cheese. Then likewise, it's headed out to the uni, but this time at a slightly lower temperature. We're shooting for 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Shuffle it on in there, and unlike the Neapolitan, which only takes about a minute to bake, this is gonna take between five and seven. You're gonna wanna rotate it often because as with any traditional pizza oven, all the heat is concentrated in the back. Try to pop any huge bubbles as you go along and pull it when it's deeply browned around the exterior and the cheese is melted and starting to display golden brown dappling. Let it rest for five minutes before slicing and serving. But don't delay because it's just not New York style pizza if it doesn't completely annihilate the roof of your mouth. And there you have it. I hope you've enjoyed these three distinctly different styles of pizza as much as I have. Though probably not because I'm the one who got to eat them all. And it was all made possible both literally and figuratively by today's sponsor, Uni, the outdoor oven that makes the best pizza at home. You might be saying, Babish, I can make a pretty awesome pizza in my kitchen oven. And to you, I'd say, I I can't actually hear you, you're talking to a screen, and that you've never had a home pizza as good as one from an uni. They have different models with a variety of fuel types like propane, wood, charcoal, and pellets. The secret, which isn't really a secret, is the stone cooking surface and the immense heat. Uni can reach temperatures of 932 degrees Fahrenheit, the same as a traditional pizza oven. Not only does this live fire heat allow you to unleash your inner pizzaiolo, it's also fast, like 60 seconds fast. What better way to celebrate National Pizza Month than by purchasing an uni pizza oven for your backyard? It can be used year round and cooks more than pizza. Basically any food that needs heat can be prepared in this oven. So head to the link in the description to find out how you can get yours and start delighting your friends and family with the best pizza they've ever had today.